I was a professional footballer for, for 20 years. I was taught to head a football and practised sometimes over 100 times a day in training. Alan Shearer, who else? Never ever did I think heading footballs could be dangerous for me. The new research which points to risks for professional footballers. Findings will fuel concerns that players' brains are being permanently damaged. Three of the surviving members of England's 1966 World Cup winning team suffering from dementia. I know ex-footballers that have had this. As a footballer, you don't expect to die at 59 of brain damage. Is there a link because you head a football? It's a disgrace. How they could cover it up? I want to find out. I want to learn. I'm not sure how I'll feel. I'll be very nervous. Each time the ball is coming in contact with the head, there's just that little bit more damage. I don't know what I'm going to find out. People may be scared to find out some answers. You've got 50,000 members. Do we know how many of those have dementia? No, I don't. I'm asking the questions that should have been answered many, many years ago. Could the beautiful game be dangerous? I'm Alan Shearer. I've been in football all my life. I've got to say that nothing quite beats the days of being out there. That's what I always dreamed of, playing at the top, playing for my country, and above all, scoring goals. I scored 260 Premier League goals, the fifth of them with my head, which must put me at risk if there is science behind the headlines about dementia and football. And if there is scientific proof, should I be talking about the game I love in the way I do? He's a good, honest centre-half, and it was an excellent header and won the game. For every goal I scored with a header in a game, I must have practised it a thousand times in training. Just like Jeff Astle did. He was good enough to play up front for England, but he was best loved at West Bromwich Albion. He was a great header of the ball and scored 174 goals. The Baggies fans called him the king. Hello, Jeff. Hello, David. Hello, David. Jeff died in 2002 at the age of 59. At his inquest, the coroner said he died of dementia brought on by years of heading the football. The first time such a connection had officially been made. So I've come to the West Midlands to meet Jeff's daughter, Dawn. Hello. Hello. Thanks Again. very much, lovely to meet you. And you. Thank you. Thank you. Fabulous, eh? Brilliant. I like the way they've got the nine Number in the nine, crown. Yeah. Nine. So tell us about your dad when you first noticed something wasn't quite right. Well, he was uh, nearly 55 and my son was born and he couldn't remember his name. And he kept saying, what's his name again? And I said, it's, it's Matthew, Dad. And it's not like an unusual name or anything. And I just kept thinking, why can't you remember his name? He suddenly came out one day and said, is my mum still alive? And I thought, like, what? she's been dead like, 17, 18 years, and I thought, what's, what's, what's he keep saying these weird things for? And it was really hard for Mum to get him to go to the doctors, because, as I say, yeah. he didn't think there was anything wrong. She got him to go in the end to the doctors. All the time he was in with the doctor, he was still glaring at Mum, as if yeah. to say, why am I here? And that's when, I suppose, uh, your life sort of changed forever then, because they said, you know, we're really sorry, but we think Jeff's got uh, early onset dementia. And then how difficult were the next three or four years. Take your time. Hello. It was, it was the most devastating, brutal mm. thing I've ever seen in my life. It used to kill me to go and see him. Mm. He'd try and get out of a moving car, you're a nervous wreck around him. Um, he would eat things you're not supposed to eat. Um, 
he'd just go into the fridge and get a big scoop of butter and add, you know, his hand and put it in his mouth. And my dad had impeccable table manners, impeccable table manners. Yeah. It was devastating to see him um, just completely change. He looked like dad mm. in the first few years, but when the disease really took a hold on him, the difference in how he looked, um, he was 59 when he died and he looked 159. Mm. And it just killed us. At the inquest today, the coroner heard from medical experts that the damage to Mr Astle's brain was the result of repeated minor trauma, probably caused by heading a heavy football. Pathologists who examined Dad's brain described how badly damaged it was. There was trauma right the way through it. And, I um, mean, that's when he said um, it, it was the repeated heading of footballs that he believed had caused all this trauma over a period of years. The ruling was industrial disease, mm. and so in other words, Dad's job had killed him. And it was a landmark decision. And it wasn't until 2014, when his brain was re-examined and it was found that he didn't have Alzheimer's, he had CTE, or boxer's brain. That's when we wanted to know why. Yeah. You know, my dad was a footballer, how did he end up with boxer's brain? So you're absolutely convinced that heading a football definitely had something to do? Definitely. With your Absolutely, definitely. Before I spoke with Dawn, I was aware of the Jeff Astle situation. But it's only now I realise that Dawn and her family have been through sheer hell. Now, I've got to try and understand this a lot more because Dawn was mentioning Boxer's brain, CTE, dementia how on earth this can be involved or linked in any way with football or heading a football. Jeff's is not an isolated case. Studies by University College London have revealed CTE in four more footballers' brains. I need answers, so I'm travelling to Glasgow to meet Dr Willie Stewart, the pathologist who found the disease in Jeff Astle's brain. Can you just explain Dementia, CTE. Great questions. Yeah. So, <laughs> dementia is where you're, you, you've got a, no, a loss of normal brain function. Your memory is affected. Sometimes your personality is affected, and, and it can progress to other systems affected as well. Right. So it's a very loose term. There's there's a, there's, there's, there's lots and lots of different types of dementia. People are really familiar with Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. Um, but there are many other types of dementia too, and this one that we are particularly interested in is chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, much yeah. easier to say. And, and that's been around for an awful long time. Um, we, we used to recognise it and see it fairly regularly in former boxers, but, but actually it could be a footballer's brain or it could be a rugby player's brain. It was a realisation that you didn't have to be a boxer to get this pathology, that actually it was exposure to brain injury and impacts so mm. that was a problem. Is that what you found in Jeff Astle's brain? Yeah. CTE is a form of dementia that can be found only after death. So I'm going to be looking at samples of brains that have been removed. I hope I'm not squeamish. And just it. Thank you. What we have here is uh, I've got three recent cases. Uh, you're looking a bit. I'm just frowning, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, three recent cases um, of uh, dementia. They've all been dissected, so. They're in bits, but just to let you see what, we, what we're dealing with. That is somebody who's dementia who didn't participate in sport, wasn't a sports person. This is football, right. this is rugby. The important thing here is that even when they've got dementia, there are very limited clues we have that allow us to say what kind of dementia they might have had. They're all a bit shrunken. Um, they all show signs of, of damage in different ways. And when we're talking about CTE, or head injury specific dementia, mm. to be more accurate, physically, there isn't that much to see at all. Right. It's all down a microscope. It's not just my untrained eye. We have to give this grey matter some colour, literally. Reveal a damage with dye. We use special techniques to show up proteins in the brain. Right. The stain we're using to show this abnormal protein up stains things brown. Protein appearing in the brain is abnormal and is associated with people with dementia. In that somebody who has no dementia has none of this protein. You see that 
hole in the yeah. middle. That's clear a blood hole, vessel. Yeah. yeah, that clear hole is a blood vessel. How we can spot it as CTE is the, the way that the, the protein clusters around blood vessels like that. It's so badly damaged that the structure of the brain has begun to disintegrate on it. So you think that is down to him playing football? Ah, the, well, it, it's all, the only thing we can say that links the cases that have been seen is exposure to brain injury. What we can't do is say exactly which part of the activity it was. Yeah. You know, and the question people ask is, is it heading? We can't say that. Because, because how do you know that it's not because he was heading the back of someone's head or he had three or four elbows exactly. during a game? Or, or Which is why I'm always very cautious when people say, uh, you're try to say it's, it's the heading yeah. in football or it's the scrum in rugby or football heading. We just don't have information on. We need to understand better what happens there right. to be able to work out what might be happening later on. OK. It's not that reassuring because if the greater danger comes from more obvious shocks to the head, well, I may qualify on that score. It would be fair to say I was a pretty robust player who gave a few knocks and took a few. Even so, what I did was surely never like this. To say this leads to CTE, or especially this, doesn't come as any sort of surprise. But can CTE be caused by something as painless as heading? I need to find out more about precisely what happens inside a head that meets a football. Neuroscientist Dr Michael Gray has a special interest in sport concussion assessment and rehabilitation. To understand this, we have to start at the beginning. Football is the only sport where the head is used as an instrument to hit the ball. Um, and so now we have to think about what, what potential damage is there? How is the brain actually protected? The brain is fixed at one point here, right about where my finger is in the brain stem here. And it sits within a fluid-filled bag, and that bag is then inside a, um, a hard skull. When the ball comes in contact with the head, what we frequently see in illustrations is this little red bit here, which would suggest that the damage is all occurring down here. And in fact, that's wrong. What we should pay attention to is the, is the wobbling that goes on in the brain. Another way to look at this is with this little jelly mold here. So imagine this jelly mold here is a brain. And if I tap the, the side of the plate like this, you can see the brain is wobbling. And that's effectively what's happening when, when the ball hits the head. What's happening inside the brain is that the nerves are getting stretched quite rapidly, and that's causing some structural damage to the nerves. The question then is, is, is this dangerous? We can get concussions from a, a single heading of the ball if the force is strong enough. And this, this will be seen in symptoms such as uh, seeing stars, such as getting a headache after, after heading the ball. That, that will lead to a concussion and then we should be taking players off the pitch. That's different than the subconcussive injury, which is still creating some, some damage but we don't actually know that anything has happened. So we don't see those stars, we, we don't get the headache, everything feels fine. Each and every time we had the ball and we get this little wobbling, if there is a little bit of damage and we don't let the brain recover, we just keep back out there doing it again and again and again, that's probably not good for the brain. There is clearly much more work to be done. Tiny changes within the brain are hard to detect. How extensive might this subconcussive damage be What's easier to measure is the overall scale of the problem. There's 850,000 people in our country that are suffering from dementia. And there are a lot of footballers in those numbers. But the reality is, and the sad thing is, we don't know how many. And that can't be right. I'm going to meet one of them. Matt Tees played professional football in the 60s and 70s in Scotland and England. His strong point? was heading the ball. Matt now suffers from dementia. Hello. Hello. How are you? Fine. I'm just admiring your gardens. Oh, They're beautiful. You. Lovely Hi. to meet you. How are you? Nice to meet you. Mate and Matt. Yeah. Yes. 
How are you? I'm all right, yeah. I just had six pins and a plate put in on my wrist cos I fell off my cycle and... Oh, crikey. Oh, well. And you've just had your golden, golden wedding. wedding anniversary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's 50, isn't 50 it? 50 years. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. 50 that, years, I that? Like that way. <laughs> she's, she's put up with you for 50 years, has she? Oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> So life good, life's hard. Yes, life's yeah. very, very good days and bad days. Yeah, I bet. Good yeah. Days and take them as they come. Yeah. We have a set routine that we must follow. Mm -hmm. uh, like, what day is it? Well, you can see up the other days put up every day. Yeah. Mark's quiet. Mm. He, he doesn't talk. He now doesn't know that this is his house. That must but be so difficult for you. That's mm -hmm. heartbreaking for mm -hmm. me, Alan. I think I've learned to be very strong yeah. because I've had to be, and it's one of the few times I could have cried. We're into sort of the final stages, right. which could be two years, ten years, right. you, nobody knows. Um, you say that yeah. with, with ease, as in you've totally accepted? I, and... I have to. Yeah, yeah. We have to live with yeah. it, Alan, don't we? And it, 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 is, it is our way of life. So tell me uh, who you used to play for and... I played with Luton. Luton, yeah. yeah. And then I, I left Luton yeah. and I went to... What's that one? Yeah. You, play, no. you played in Scotland. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then you come down to Grimsby. Yeah. And then you went to London, to Charlton. Charlton Athletic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Centre half or centre forward? Yeah. Oh, centre forward. Goal scorer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a typical photograph of Matt. <laughs> Up there and heading that ball. That's some header. <laughs> and there's the happy goal scorer, Matt T. Do you think there is a link to football? I think there has to, to be. Matt. I've got no you, doubt there has about to be. it, Alan. Without trying hard, I can name about eight people Matt's played football in this area with that's in this area? had dementia really? or Alzheimer's, yeah. Wow. Yeah, so I mean, that speaks volumes, mm. in my opinion. My grandsons, uh, two of them are really good footballers, and I went to watch my, th the one in the blue shirt up there. Yeah. Honestly, I wanted, I felt sick. Really? That he, bad? He plays sweeper, and he's jumping up, heading them like this, and I just thought, mm. oh, and my heart was going like this. I couldn't believe my reaction, and how because I know yeah. what I know now. Come on in, guys. Yeah, hello. It's a job. Nice to meet you. How are you? How are you? Oh, hello. Nice oh, nice hello. Nice to meet you. Right. Left hand, I'm afraid. <laughs> Hi, guys. How are you? <laughs> you're the centre half and you're yeah, the right back. Yeah. So you both head the ball. Yeah. You take after your granddad and head the ball. <laughs> yeah, do you? Yeah. yeah. They never saw me when I was at my yeah. best. <laughs> does it? Does it worry you boys about heading the ball? No. No. Um, you think it about it? It wouldn't. I don't. I don't really think about it, but when if there is a link, like yeah. I wouldn't stop doing it. And has Grandma told you what she thinks of football and heading and etc.? Yeah, we've mm. spoke about it yeah. like before. Does that worry you? Um, a little bit, but yeah. obviously I don't think it has changed a bit because obviously when Grandpa used to do it, yeah. it would have been. Like if it was wet, the leather balls, balls they'd have been yeah, yeah. heavy. Whereas mm -hmm. nowadays they're quite light. Yeah. Do you think the our authorities um, would be running away from this problem? I've got two sons and three grandsons, mm. and I, I would I want research. I don't want my daughter-in-laws and my grandchildren's partners and wives in the future to go through what we go through now. Life's quite frightening for Matt now. Yeah. What struck me about seeing the Tees family, it wasn't just Matt that's suffering. It's me that has to carry everything. And the grandkids, it surprised me that they're so keen and wanting and willing to go out and head balls, despite seeing their granddad in the way he is uh, and what their grandma has to deal with. Are Matt's grandchildren putting themselves in harm's way by heading the ball? I'm returning to Scotland to see if science has the answer. I did science at school, I did a lot of things at school, but other than football I wasn't very good at school. <laughs>
At the University of Stirling, studies are underway specific to heading of football. It's groundbreaking work in the UK, prompted by worries about old players. We started getting reports of concerns of the effects of long-term heading in yeah. football. Yeah. Um, so we decided to set up a, a laboratory controlled trial um, where we mimicked the effects of heading a ball in a training drill, as in a cross kick from a corner uh, into the goal. But importantly, what we did, we put together psychology and physiology to look at the effects of this impact of the ball on their head. Yeah. Until quite recently, that was difficult to look almost inside the brain yeah. what's going on. And now we have that technology from basic science, we can apply that and, 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 and really to start to understand what is the direct impact. My guess would be it's not so much heading a football in a match, it's actually doing it in training. Heading the ball once is not going to give you brain damage. Yeah. And we're not talking about brain damage, we're talking about brain changes yeah. that are short-lived but repeated mm. over and over again. And yes, we are most worried about the practice drills. And how, how far um, have you come? What results have you had? First time we tried it, um, it was very clear um, that um, there are immediate brain changes uh, after heading the ball. The research they've been doing has focused on modern players but first, we're going to examine the leather footballs of Jeff and Matt's era. A lot of the thought is that the, the older balls were heavier. Um, Had to have been, mustn't they? Um, but I'll be curious to find out what you think when you're heading the ball. <laughs> OK. Is that OK? Absolutely. Right. OK, ready? Yeah. That actually feels lighter. Good point. So when we weighed them, these, this was actually about 40 grams lighter than this one. Right. It was but the issue with these balls were the fact when they got wet and all yeah. the stitching got soaked in everything else. Yeah. What we've done is actually soaked a ball in water for two hours. And what we'll do, we'll weigh it. So, OK. Because we weighed it beforehand, so just see if the weight has changed. So it's gained quite a bit of weight. That was 390 grams we weighed it. Right. And that's now 595 grams. So you can see there, there is an issue with when the ball is wet, it would have weighed a lot more, no question. Thankfully, I didn't have to head those big leather, brown, ugly, wet balls, which were incredibly heavy when wet. It seems to me the guys in the 60s and 70s got a bit of a raw deal having to head those things. I'm now going to do my bit to measure what happens when the ball I did play with meets my head. 19 players have been tested so far. Meet number 20. What precisely will be going on inside this head of mine when it goes back to doing its old job? We're going to do a battery of tests to look at the effects of heading a football. Um, first of all, we'll be doing a cognitive um, test. What's a cognitive test? The tests of reaction time and of memory. What type of questions? I hope they're nice and easy ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, they start easy and they get more difficult. OK. Brilliant. So in the first test, you'll see six white, white boxes. and um, They'll open up on, in a random order. There's going to be a pattern inside one of the boxes to start off with. You have to remember where the pattern is. I'll be doing these tests before my headers and again afterwards, and we'll compare the results. Oh, did I get it wrong? You must have got one wrong. Oh. <laughs> I feel like I'm back at school now. <laughs> OK, so this time we're going to do the same thing, but there's going to be three patterns, so it does get progressive. Here's where it gets interesting. <laughs> oh. Got it wrong again, haven't I? Oi! <laughs> OK, so we're on to the second test. So this okay. one is a test of your spatial working memory. Excellent. The next stage, we're going to be using this press pad. OK. So am I a genius or what, then? <laughs> yeah, I think you did pretty well. <laughs> 
I thought we were going to be here all afternoon. Was... <laughs> OK, well, what we're going to do now is look at your balance. Okay. We want to see if that changes as a result of doing the heading. If you want to stand on the balance board, try and keep this circle in the centre of the screen. OK, and step down. Perfect. Very good. So that's you done with the balance testing. So okay. now we'll move next door. What we're going to do now is a bit of a magnetic stimulation on the top of your brain right. to see how your muscle responds. So if you want to give a couple of contractions. Right, so you see that activity there? Yes. That's your brain instructing the muscle to contract. So it sends electrical impulses down to the muscle. So when you see these blue bits here, yeah. That's your electrical activity on the muscle. And we're going to be measuring what happens when we actually give a stimulus from the brain. This is called transcranial magnetic stimulation. It works by placing this coil over your head. So depending on where Tom stimulates, yeah. you'll see a twitch in a different muscle. All right. We'll see a twitch, will we? Yeah, we'll uh, see a twitch. Yeah, we'll... This measure looks at how easy the, the signal travels from your brain to the muscle. And push up. Halfway there. One. And relax. Good, how does that feel? Fine. OK. That's the before tests done. After I've headed the ball 20 times, we'll do the same tests again and the team will compare before and after. Now, the bit in the middle. This is where it gets interesting. OK. Ready in three, two, one. Perfect. That's one. Good header. It's really good. So you now I'm meant to run away with my arm in the air. <laughs> <laughs> Celebrate. <laughs> in three, two, one. Ah, I missed uh, that one. A couple more. Good header. Very good. Last one. In three, two, one. Excellent. Perfect. Right, that's us. You've successfully completed yeah. the heading protocol. Well done. Cool. So we'll take the headband off you. OK. Go straight through, eh? Yep, we go cool. straight through. Through the lab. Yep. yep. See what damage it's done. <laughs> right. oh. I'll have a red head down. My hair used to cover it when I was playing. <laughs> <laughs> so what differences do you think you'll see here, if any? Some changes in the way the brain communicates with the muscles. Maybe the impulses take a bit longer to get down or come a bit smaller. OK. It's good. Keep it there, nice and steady. It's really good. Can't say I enjoyed the jolts going through my skull that much. Balance test the cognitive tests, and now we wait. OK, we've, we've found some interesting results. Good um, or bad? <laughs> well, I don't know how you found the cognitive testing, the results. They look quite similar to those that we were finding in the study itself. You did better on the eight-item mm. portion the first time round, yeah. and then you did worse than that the yeah. second time round. We had no change in your balance. Right. If anything, a slight improvement, which we also found in the study, probably slightly to do with a a learning effect. Magdalena will tell you a little bit about the brain changes we got. OK. So remember that we stimulated your brain and we looked at the neural signal as it travelled from the brain to the muscle it controls. Yeah. And um, we do find in you what we also found in the study. So the blue line is your first time before heading the ball. Right. And um, you see the stim, that big peak at the start, yeah. and then you see silence, yeah? Yeah. and then it starts squibbling again. And then you can see in the red graph underneath that, after hitting the ball, that, that period is longer. That right. means there's, there's higher levels of inhibition okay. in, in the brain. Right, which means? So really what we're seeing here, after um, hitting the ball, is a disruption of the normal brain chemistry. If I came in here and looked at the graph, I would say it looked pretty similar. But there is a difference, as in it, it is a little bit slower, the second one, than it is the first one. Which, But when, if you come to think of it, then heading a football at 20 or 25 miles per hour 
20 balls like I did in quick succession, then you would think it has to do something. The arrow afterwards is slightly to the right. It takes longer to return to normal. And in an hour or two's time, we'd expect that to go back to normal. We don't know, because no research has been done, what happens when you head the ball 50 times, yeah. or you do it again tomorrow, and the next, next day, day, and the next day. Right. So the cumulative effects, we don't know how they add up. Right. And, and the suspicion is that if you start looking at that, you might find more evidence for changes in brain health as a function of heading the ball. I'm leaving Sterling, grateful that I didn't play with the old ball when it got wet but slightly worried that heading any kind of ball causes changes to the brain. There's still work to be done. Football should be encouraging these universities to do as much research as possible. But like everything else, these universities need funding. There's enough money around nowadays in football, just not enough of it has been given to research. It's about time that we had more definitive answers. I've met scientists who are concerned, like me, but what about fellow footballers? I'm meeting up with an ex-player who was also my first manager, Chris Nickel. He taught me so much when it came to heading. Hey, how are you? Nice to see you. I'm good, nice mate. To see you. I'm very good. Good. You haven't, you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> and you, thanks. Yeah, Sit I've down. still got more hair. <laughs> I thought it was terrible. Amazing. See, that's what you've done to me. Here's Nickel. Chris was 20 years a player before he went into management, a League Cup winner with Aston Villa. He joined Southampton as a centre-half and rejoined them as manager. He gave me my big break in the game. Do you remember those days at Southampton? I do, do yeah. You, do you? No, I'm, no like, I'm, I'm brain damaged mm. from heading balls. Do you, do you, you never do you have... headed enough, did you? I did, I headed far too much. The reason why is that you had me in the gym most Tuesdays really? and Thursdays in the gym at Southampton, yeah. chucking balls in the air for me to constantly head balls. Now my memory's so terrible. It's my fault. Is it? <laughs> do you genuinely believe that heading balls? Yes, is, is, is I do. Because my of the memory for you? is in trouble. Yeah, I How, forget things. Where, I forget regular things like when you forget where your keys are. Or yeah. I mean, that, all people do that. But when you forget where you live, somebody says, where do you live? Mm. And it won't... How long, have, how long have you had that? How long have you felt like that? Can you remember? Do you know? The La last, last four, four, five years. Have you, yeah. And it's, Something like and it's that. getting worse, you think, yeah? yeah? Yeah, it is definitely getting worse. Have you been to the doctors? No. And to, to... No. Why? Because I wouldn't change anything anyway. But I they could the help way... you? Well, maybe, yeah. So you but won't... I do forget things. Mm. When when somebody says where do you live and you've forgotten yeah, that, yeah. like that, that is, a, is if... a bit of a message. Does it worry you? How you are? It bothers me. Yeah, does it? it does bother me. But uh, doesn't worry you enough to go to a doctor? No. No. I still wouldn't change it. And stop being big change. and brave and bravado. No. It, does no. it? Does it not worry you? I, I know. It, it I'm get getting worse because because things like oh, whoever put that knife or yeah. whoever put yeah. me toast or mm. it goes even knowing that it does damage your brain I wouldn't change you still thing. do it I would not change a thing because it was my job mm. to go and head it but you I, I would worry if you want, wanted to change the way you did no, no. because I was part of that my immediate reaction is his attitude is so typical of football, of footballers, um, doesn't want help, doesn't want to admit that uh, help would be, I think, a huge advantage to him, which is very concerning and very worrying. Football's reluctance to do anything was changed when brain damage was addressed elsewhere, namely in American football. And once a connection was made between brain trauma and CTE, the National Football League moved quickly to set up a compensation fund worth three quarters of a billion dollars. Across the United States and across all sports, protecting the head is fully on the agenda. But on Monday, the U.S. Soccer Federation took the bold step of eliminating heading from youth soccer in an effort to reduce the number of concussions. 
Per the new rules, children 10 and under will be banned from heading the ball during any official session. The banning of heading the ball in, in the United States is really more about concussion rather than heading the ball over and over. And it, it's really about when these kids go up for a challenge, their, their heads come in contact with, with other heads, or they hit an arm or they fall on the floor, um, and, that, and that creates more significant damage in, in, the, in the brains. Young girls seem to get concussion more frequently than young boys, and we don't really know why that is. We, we need to understand that. Now the problem is, we don't have conclusive scientific evidence to suggest that heading the ball in young children is going to lead to neurodegeneration later in life. We know, for example, that, that children have large heads and small necks, so there's more wobbling of the brain inside the skull. Therefore, that can lead to more damage compared with an adult. The other issue that we have is that children's brains are still developing, and we, they don't have the same neuroprotection as, as does an adult. We don't have conclusive evidence that that is then leading to, to problems later in life or problems in school. I tend to agree with the idea that very young children really shouldn't be heading the ball. I think we have sufficient evidence that certainly from, from my point of view, I wouldn't want my children um, heading the, you know, playing on a team where they're heading the ball day in and day out. I don't think it's worth the risk. Imagine if the game without heading became the new football for everyone at every level. An old England teammate of mine went into coaching, Les Ferdinand, first with Tottenham Hotspur, now director of football at Queen's Park Rangers. He is aware of the debate and his responsibility for keeping his young footballers safe. It was very different when he first started heading the ball. One of the coaches was having a laugh and saying, ah, it's all right, the young black boys don't hit balls. So I made it my mission to be able to head balls. Yeah. From doing all that, it was a major concern for me down, yeah. you know, when I started hearing all this. Did you ask the young boys at, uh, at Tottenham when you were a coach there, or tell them that, that they had to improve their heading, they had to do heading practices? I didn't tell them, they came to me and wanted to improve it. Right, okay. Because it was kind of like one of my fortes. Yeah. So I carried on, you know, teaching people that wanted to learn the way that I learned. Because you're aware now of the, uh, of the issue mm -hmm. and the subject, um, would you ever consider changing training techniques for the young boys that are coming through the, uh, the system here at QPR? I think what I'd do is, uh, you know, I'd, I'd want to see more research. I would speak to the coaches um, and we will have this discussion about what we do with the players because I know, you know, in America they've banned it so everyone's yeah. talking about it and that's, that's gathering momentum on um, whether we need to work the, the technique with softballs yeah. just until we can gather some more information to yeah. know this is, uh, this is good for football or not. Changes in training, changes on the field. As he was most of the game, he was first to the corner, he wanted it more than they did. Long ball football, the English game for so many years, of firing the ball out of the defence, high towards a big man up front, has given way to a more subtle game. A game played with the ball kept on the grass, played to the feet. Fabulous football. Expert headers of the ball have had to adapt. John Terry, for example, five times a Premier League champion with Chelsea, still playing at Aston Villa. So you definitely think that you don't head the ball now uh, as much one in training or, or two in a game as you did years ago? Yeah, in, in training it's probably probably zero actually because the ball's probably 99% on the floor. Right. I think the game's evolved over the years as well. I think you know when I first come on the scene playing, goalkeeper would kick it and I would try and head it as far as I could back up the field. Right, yeah. I think the distance side of it has kind of gone out of the game a little bit. With the managers that you've had over the years, has there been a different feeling towards heading regarding foreign coaches or the English coaches? Well, I think the English coaches definitely, kind of my early days, yeah. YTS days, first year pros, that kind of thing, was, was really kind of specified on, you know, doing that in training, training drills. I think as the foreign coaches come in, it was a case of, right, can you chest it, can you bring it down? But I'm seeing hardly anything at all in training, right. unless you're doing a shooting exercise mm -hmm. and you might, you know, Compared score. to when you first started training oh, many years ago? Yeah, yeah. 100%. It, yeah. And uh, that's been the case for the last probably six, seven years for me. So, so I think as the game's kind of getting better and we're learning, you know, it's, it's going to help in the future anyway. Good. Would there ever be a, a time that you said to your kids, no, you're not allowed to head the ball? No. Because you have a boy and a girl. Yeah, probably the opposite, actually. And my girl plays at Chelsea. And actually, I'm encouraging her to go and attack it because yeah. more so in girls' football, 
they don't really head the ball. And the kind of corner comes in and everyone kind of shies away from it a little bit. And I'm trying to encourage my girl that rather than that ball hit you and kind of probably do some damage, yeah. if you go and attack it and meet the ball, mm. the contact's better, you know, no point heading it There's a the technique. Yeah, there is a yeah. technique to it, yeah. And I think if you can do that in the right way, I think you'll prevent, hopefully, anything in the mm. future. Yeah. The researchers actually say that, um, that girls are more at risk than boys or men. Yeah. Does that, will that change your feeling towards that? <laughs> Listen, it's my little girl. Yeah. She, she's my world, you know. It's, I think her playing and seeing her playing, she loves football. No, I would still encourage her to go and attack it. I think until there's real evidence to show that players in the future are really suffering, yeah. or we can actually pinpoint it to, to specifically head in the ball, as a parent, as my kids, I wouldn't discourage them to go and head the ball. Football, slow to change without more evidence, but changing all the same. There are protocols in place when it comes to concussion, which isn't the same thing as the repeated action of heading, but at least shows greater respect for the head, which wasn't always the case in my day. There's pictures out there um, with me in a bandage. There's blood teeming down my face where I've gone off, I've had stitches. They've put a bandage on, I've gone and headed another ball. Stitches have come out and you can visibly see the blood pouring down my face, um, which is, is what we did then what was expected of us. You ran off the pitch, you got stitched up, and you had to go back on again. I've taken the big blows, and I played at a time when heading was still very fashionable. I've taken all those little impacts that may add up to something. I seem to qualify in all counts to ask the question, am I in danger? I think the time has come to put myself to the big test, an MRI scan at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, Glasgow what damage from all that heading will be revealed. I'm a bit nervous, actually, now. Oh, you shouldn't <laughs> be nervous. So, just take a seat, Alan, and I'll get one of the red dog first to go through the MRI checklist with you. Okay, dog. I'm a bit nervous, actually. Just give me the, uh, the words as in to say, you do know that if we find something, then... <laughs> I said, well, if you do, it's best that you tell me so we can work on something. So, surgery in your lifetime, you've had tendon repair on your left knee twice, yep. ACL repair, yep. hernias, um, fracture dislocated your ankle. Yep. That's that the only things you've had? No other the only things, that's all. enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else that's has it, yeah. slipped your mind. <laughs> nice gear, eh? Right? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do a nice structural scan of your brain. So that'll take about five minutes. And then we're going to do what we call a spectroscopy scan. So that actually gives us a nice profile of some of the chemicals in your brain. Right. And if there's any problems, then we can, we can discuss that further and, and inform your clinician. Have you got any concerns or questions? No, I think I'm all right. How are you doing, Alan? Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, just going to get started nice and still. There's going to be some loud noise coming up. So we're acquiring a scan at the minute, and uh, once we've acquired, we've acquired that, we'll plan the spectroscopy scan. That's the scan that looks at the, the chemicals in, in Alan's brain. And again, we'll be looking to see that that's normal. I don't like your way you've all been a bit apprehensive here. No, we're fine. <laughs> so, so, a nice way I think about the brain is you've got your white matter, which is a bit like all the connections. So you see that in light grey here, and then there's the grey matter, which is the cortex, so the bit on the outside, and the, the white matter is a bit like the connections with the, the grey matter, you know, the bit that's doing the thinking or the processing. Your brain's sitting in this sort of protective fluid, so that's what the... So some people think you're looking at the holes in them and you think there's yeah. holes in your brain, but it's, per <laughs> it's perfectly normal to have those holes. Good. <laughs> we did notice you had a little artefact, we think, or just on the surface of your brain, that it might be just from a little bit of metal, maybe. Have I? Potentially, yeah. yes. Oh, interesting. Mm. 
we were able to look at That's an area of your brain and to look at the sort of chemical profile for that area. So this looks uh, normal to me for that area of the brain. That's reassuring. I'll tell you that as good news. That's good news. <laughs> Got some metal in my head. Just an old stable to patch me up after a clash of heads. I was a little bit nervous when I was going in there, but uh, having the news that everything is fine and is, uh, and is normal, and, and I, the question I asked him was, um, if you didn't know who I was or, um, or if I'd played football for 20 years, then um, would you look at that brain and, and say it was perfectly normal? The answer came back and said it was, uh, it was perfectly normal and, and all fine, so very good news. In general, I've come through it pretty well. I'm as relieved as an old pro can be, I suppose. Nothing to be worried about for the moment. But footballers seem particularly prone to early onset dementia. CTE stalks us. I can't shake off the idea of it and the struggle that may lie ahead. John Styles knows all about that. He's the son of Nobby, Man United legend and the cheeky face of a golden age. Nobby is one of the 1966 World Cup heroes struck down by dementia. How's your dad? Poorly. Is he? Yeah, Alan, he's uh, advanced, got advanced dementia, mm. um, so he's now in a home. It's just terrible to watch the person that you love, especially somebody as lively yeah. and as nice a person as my dad, just disappear, really. <laughs> <laughs> Do you hold the game responsible? I'm utterly convinced that um, heading the ball in training yep. is... Um, I, I believe it's responsible, but that's only my opinion. Are you angry? And if so, what are you angry about? What I'm really angry about, Alan, is that it's been known for a long time now, um, since Jeff Astle's diagnosis, a coroner actually said heading the ball has contributed to him killing him. What I'm angry about is, in that time, nothing's been done. Yeah. And dementia is treated as a different... It's not treated as a disease, it's treated like old age, mm. so you've got to cover the cost yourself. And all these families, as well as watching their loved one disappear, have got no help, and most of them have had to sell the homes to pay for the care. Mm. Now, if that's been caused by heading the ball, that's a disgrace. Mm. What do you feel that needs to be done? I think, as they've done in America, they've banned it for under-11s. Yep. I think they should do that now, and I think that... Banning heading now for kids? I, well, I believe so. Yeah. I, in the matches, you head the ball maybe, what, three, four times maybe, but it's the training. Yeah. It's the training that, that's the problem. And I think coaches shouldn't be throwing missiles at kids' heads for them to head it back. Until we know, yeah. they should absolutely stop kids heading balls. Right. My oldest son now is 33. He tried to be a footballer. And I don't feel a guilt as such, but if my boy ends up developing problems, that could have been prevented, and that's a disgrace. Yeah, that, that has to be a concern and a worry for you. Yeah. yeah. And I'm almost complicit in that. I can see why football is reluctant to change its rules. No heading would be like cricket without fast bowling, or rugby banning tackling. But there's also the question of the duty of care. Players who really aren't that old going into care homes to die. Who can help? Well, there's the Professional Footballers Association, the PFA, the Players' Union, and there's the Football Association, the FA, the sports governing body. Of course, they need the facts first. Facts that come from research, scientific research. Dawn Astle has campaigned for answers from the authorities since her dad's death 15 years ago. But are they out there looking for them? The PFA and the FA started a study back in 2001, which was actually before dad died. But I had an email off the FA to say, unfortunately, you know, it didn't reach its conclusions because. Um, They'd done it on 30-odd youngsters in the game and none of them made it as pros, so they fell away. So it only lasted a few years. So that was so bitterly, bitterly disappointing. So it was as if we, it collapsed, they thought we'd gone away and they just left it. And that's and I, wrong. I know you have had meetings that you have asked questions and they have promised you they would send uh, questions to FIFA. And that was two or three years ago and you're still waiting for answers, is that correct? Football doesn't, doesn't seem to want to know. Yeah. And it should want to know. It, it, it's not just about Dad now. It's about all these for, former footballers and their families who, who, have, who have come forward very bravely. I said it's not just about the past now. 
it's about football's future. You know, we've got to protect, you know, kids into the game, the fu you know, football's future. The PFA, they only exist for player welfare. They should be screaming from the rooftops for these players. This is killing their players. This should be their priority. The surprising thing for me is, is actually no one has stood up and said, you know what, we got this one wrong. We should have looked into it more. No one said, yeah, we've messed up here. We had a chance to do something 15 years ago, and we haven't. What is being done, or what isn't being done? Gordon Taylor has been chief executive of the Players' Union, the PFA, for 36 years. Looking after players past and present is what he does. You've got 50,000 members. Yeah. Do we know how many of those have dementia? No, I don't. Is that uh, difficult to do? Can we not? Because that's not an easy thing to do. At the moment, do, with modern technology, out. we're looking to try to establish a really effective database. There's an anger from my side because over the last 12 months, having sat down with um, families who have lost loved ones, there's a lot of them feel as if they've been left on their own. Mm. I think it's the PFA's job to do all we can yeah. to look to provide support. We have said money is going to be put towards research and also towards respite care mm. for the more and more former players who need help. I went up and spoke to Willie Stewart and I said to him, what is it you need? And he said, well, we need research. Mm. And well, I'm thinking, well, hang on a minute, we started, maybe we started the research in 2002, it's now 2017, yeah, and know. it seems as if we're no further forward. Well, it, it's... Because the same questions are still being asked. They are. The issue of the lower level, uh, but continuous problems with head in a ball mm. and whether it will have long-term effects, is something we are looking to establish either a definitive link or not oh, at no. all. And from that point of view, the first research we've done was inconclusive, but we are prepared to commit the money to research. Do you think it's been swept under the carpet a little bit because of, of people, people who have been feel, scared to face people feel lawsuits? Bitter. Yeah. Well, it has been put to me that maybe the clubs are very wary because there may be compensation. I said, well, you, you know, you can only have, you can only be negligent if you know for certain. Yeah that there is this link. But what I am saying is football has a duty to see if there is a causal link, yeah. because if there is, that could significantly increase the problems in later life, then we'd need to look at the rules of the game and, mm. and address it. I've been disappointed uh, with FIFA, but as the governing body, they have not taken the lead or any of the confederations, but it's fair to say the FA have now agreed that we will do this together. I'm not exactly bowled over by the rush to investigate. Nobody in charge seems to want to know the scale of the problem, if there is one. Footballers played everywhere. The game is run by the Football Association, the FA. I've come to their home at St George's Park to see their new medical performance director, Charlotte Cowie. One of Charlotte's first tasks has been to commission research into this issue. Do you know how many footballers have got dementia? I think that, in a nutshell, is the question that we're asking. And it sounds quite simple. You can just go to a load of footballers and say, you can check if they've got dementia, and then you've got your, your, your answer. What I've probably learned um, is to run a research project where you get some answers that are reliable. It's more complicated than that. Um, we've used a panel of experts in concussion and in research mm -hmm. to try and help us formulate a study um, that gives us an answer as quickly as possible, if we can do, but more importantly gives us some results that are really reliable. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that research. What is it you're actually doing? What we'd like to do is make it potentially a shorter study by looking back at ex-professional footballers and working out whether they have health problems including dementia. We'll, we'll also look at their general health. The most important thing is, is dementia more common in footballers than in the normal population? That's the question that Dawn Astle and everybody else wants yeah. to know, is it a problem? Mm. And I think one of the things that we need to try and establish is that if there is a link to um, it, to football and dementia in some players, if that is related to concussion, 
And if that is the risk, rather than heading, th then we need to know that as well. They've banned heading in America for under-11s. Yeah. What's your feeling on that? Do you think we should do that in this country? I think that is open for review at any point. Um, if evidence is emerging, even early evidence, then I think that's something that we, we always have to bear in mind. But at the moment, the advice that we're getting from people who are, who are working in that area is yeah. that they don't feel that that's the, the most logical step to take. There is a lot of anger yeah. out there from people who have suffered and the families that are now suffering. Can you understand why? Yeah, massively. I met with the Astor family. Yeah. Um, talking to Dawn about what she and her family went through, watching Jeff in the sort of the last stages of a really horrific disease, yeah. um, probably affected me emotionally a lot, actually. And so I feel very personally invested in trying to see this through and make it happen. Mm. And I think we're in a good place now, but I do understand there's been a lot of frustration and, you know, what. Whatever the answers are, a lot of heartache. It seems as if people are running away from this problem. Mm. Do you get that feeling? Well, I feel th that's the one thing that I can say with confidence. I feel we're running towards this problem at the right. moment. I, I do feel like... But that um, hasn't the been F the case in the past. I think the FA's made it, did make a conscious decision um, not to wait for FIFA or UEFA, and I think that was the right decision and they've done the right thing on that, but it was probably a difficult decision to make. As the FA are custodians of the game, do you feel as if apologies are owed to the families that have suffered and still don't have any answers? Um, I think certainly we need to consider those people um, and then I think we need to just... I think the FA just needs to get this done. That, mm. That's what I would say. The research has at last been commissioned. But even before we have new findings, football must look after all players with dementia. Put an end to this sense that once you're done with playing, you can be put on the scrap heap. Life can be confusing and scary for people with dementia, but there are support groups for those who are living with it. One such group offering support to families is Sporting Memories. Former centre forward Matt Tees has invited me along to his local group at Waltham Library in Grimsby. <laughs> Have a seat. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. This is my seat. Yes. <laughs> By pure coincidence, we've just been doing an Alan Shearer quiz. Oh, so good. maybe you could answer the last question for us. How many career goals did Alan have to his name by the end of the 97-98 season? <laughs> have you not made an easier one for me? Career goals. Sporting Memories is a charity which works with elderly people who might struggle with dementia, depression, or loneliness. They use sport as a way of bringing people together. We know that people need to remain connected. That's to their family, to their friends, to their communities, and to their passions and interests. And sport is a huge common factor in terms of getting people together. Yeah. Yeah. But we also know that to age well, we need to learn new things. And the Sporting Memories Group, you can learn so many different new things around the history and heritage of sport and people's stories. Dennis, 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 no. We'll have to stress it's not a dementia focused yeah. group. Um, not everybody has dementia, but. Majority? No, no. Minority. Right, okay. But it's about mixing people up, yeah. it's about inclusion and integration. Mm. And, and they love and it. Everybody has a yeah, fantastic love it, yeah. time. Sporting Memories have worked with the Professional Footballers Association to produce a leaflet that can be given to former players who have been diagnosed with dementia. The guide has been written to give some practical advice to people who have got that diagnosis. And these are ready now? They're just at the designers uh, and the PFA will be making them available to, to members. I was a professional footballer for, for 20 years. I was taught to head a football and practised sometimes over 100 times a day in training. Alan Shearer, who else? Never ever did I think heading footballs could be dangerous for me. The new research which points to risks for professional footballers. Findings will fuel concerns that players' brains are being permanently damaged. Three of the surviving members of England's 1966 World Cup winning team suffering from dementia. I know ex-footballers 
that have had this. As a footballer, you don't expect to die at 59 of brain damage. Is there a link because you head a football? It's a disgrace. How they could cover it up? I want to find out. I want to learn. Not sure how I'll feel. I'll be very nervous. Each time the ball is coming in contact with the head, there's just that little bit more damage. I don't know what I'm going to find out. People may be scared to find out some answers. You've got 50,000 members. Do we know how many of those have dementia? No, I don't. I'm asking the questions that should have been answered many, many years ago. Could the beautiful game be dangerous? I'm Alan Shearer. I've been in football all my life. I've got to say that nothing quite beats the days of being out there. That's what I always dreamed of, playing at the top, playing for my country, and above all, scoring goals. I scored 260 Premier League goals. 